Well, of course, as a presidential re-election campaign gets closer, presidents tend to be a little less innovative uh, than they are at the beginning of a term. Uh, and when you add to that President Obama's domestic difficulties with health care and now with the economy, and now, of course, with this extraordinary uh, flowering uh, of something called the Tea Party uh, and the consequences all of this may have for the midterm elections, then I don't think President Obama has been applying uh, the kind of attention to the whole issue of multilateral disarmament, which he foreshadowed in his Prague speech, of course, to quite the same extent. And I think one has to understand that. I mean, the truth of the matter is that if there's been a stalling or a parking of the initiative on multilateralism, uh, it can, like so many other things, be laid at the door of the economic crisis. Uh, because it's quite often difficult for governments to concentrate on more than one issue at a time. Although, curiously, here in Britain, of course, the whole question of Trident renewal has become bound up in the Defence Review. Why? Because the Conservative part of the coalition said that it wanted the Trident renewal to be kept out of the Defence Review. Uh, whereupon the Chancellor of the Exchequer said, apparently adhering to that principle, uh, well that's all very well, but the cost of Trident renewal has got to come out of the core defence budget. There will be no special financial arrangements made for it. And what that necessarily means is that in making decisions about bases to close, about how many ships to build, about how many fast jet aircraft to have, uh, the influence of the uh, substantial expenditure which will be necessary within uh, this and the next parliament on Trident is very considerable. It is, as I said uh, elsewhere, uh, the four submarines are like the elephants in the room. I'm one of those who believes uh, that uh, simply to tick a box and say we need a like-for-like -like replacement of Trident fails to take account of the movement towards multilateralism, the changed, albeit for the moment static political circumstances with regard to nuclear weapons, uh, fails to take account too uh, of the fact that Trident's Cold War weapon, uh, which is designed to obliterate Moscow, and you have to ask yourself, is that the level of nuclear deterrence which is necessary for the United Kingdom in 2010 or even in 2025 uh, and fails also to take account of the fact uh, that because of these financial pressures we've been discussing then there's a lot to be said for increased cooperation. Uh, I don't mean uh, one submarine and uh, crews drawn from a variety of nations but for example the French operate uh, seaborne nuclear deterrent, they operate uh, submarines like ourselves, then there should be more discussion about how we can have perhaps integrated patrolling so that we don't both always need to have a submarine on station. If you do that, of course, you can then look uh, more uh, progressively at the notion of a continuous at sea dis deterrent, something called CASD. Uh, and if we were to uh, modify that principle, uh, then that would have the consequence of extending the life of the existing Trident submarines. That would help financially, but it would also allow us to see whether the movement which began with the speech in Prague is actually going to come to something, whether there are more uh, concrete achievements uh, in re with regard to nuclear disarmament than we've seen already. And then in that environment to ask ourselves the question, what sort of nuclear deterrent does the United Kingdom require? When we've talked about multilateralism, we have to some extent ignored the problems of proliferation, and that's been a mistake. Uh, and that's why uh, having a unified approach at the United Nations among the permanent members of the Security Council to inhibit Iran, if we possibly can, from achieving a military nuclear capability is so important because there's a lot of evidence to suggest that if the Iranians were to achieve a military nuclear capability, then Saudi Arabia would necessarily respond by doing the same, followed by Egypt and perhaps even by Turkey. Now, in a region which is already uh, hostage to instability, uh, then the fact that there were a series of countries uh, with nuclear capability could only add to that instability 
uh, and could make the prospect, uh, albeit perhaps even inadvertently, of some kind of nuclear exchange much more likely. As to whether one should be optimistic or pessimistic, I don't think one should be either. I think one should be realistic. One should uh, be quick to identify opportunities. Um, and uh, when opportunities are, are identified, one should be equally quick to take them. That's why, for example, President Obama's um, deal uh, with President Medvedev uh, in relation to a START treaty was extremely helpful, extremely hopeful as well. Uh, that was an opportunity which was seized. If there are similar opportunities, then we should certainly try to take these too. But uh, if one takes the view that the United States is really the pivot around which uh, a lot of these proposals necessarily are based, then unless and until President Obama feels sufficiently strong at home to turn his attention to foreign affairs, then we're likely to remain in the kind of static condition which we are at the moment. That doesn't mean to say, though, that we can't go ahead and prepare for the moment when the logjam breaks. That's why the top-level group is so important and why similar organisations in other European countries and indeed elsewhere in the world are of equal importance. So this is a moment uh, for preparation, not necessarily a moment for achievement. But you don't get achievement unless you do the preparation first.